This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Nicole Cleaver. I am the host for tonight's event. We have a pretty neat lineup for our presentation tonight. Uh, it's titled Healthy Habits for the New Year, Keeping Your Joints Active and Healthy. And Dr. Danielle Ponzio is going to start our lecture off. Um, and then the second half is going to be with Joanna DeSantis, who her video is on here. Um, you can actually see her. Hey, Joanna. Uh, Joanna is a physical therapist with NovaCare Rehabilitation. She sees patients in uh, their Bayville, New Jersey office, which is an office in Southern Ocean County, for those of you who aren't familiar with the area. Um, but the second half of the presentation, she is going to demonstrate some exercises that are good for joint health. Um, I know when we were registering for the event, I had asked for questions, so we took, I took a lot of time to sort through those, and um, I think everybody will find beneficial the ones that we've put together to answer. Um, Joanna has catered her exercises and her questions and answers around those that were submitted, and Dr. Lombio has done the same. Um, but in addition to that, you'll see that there is a chat box available. It should be in the, probably the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. I will be monitoring that throughout the presentation, so feel free to enter any questions that you have there as well, and we will do our best to answer those. Um, I am also recording this presentation, so if you have to hop off for whatever reason, or if maybe there's something you want to refer back to, um, I will be sending a link out, usually um, by the end of the week, so that everybody can view that and or pass it along to anybody else that they see fit. Um, but other than that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Ponzio. So she's going to get started. And like I said, there's that chat box. So go ahead and enter any questions you may have. And if there's anything I can help with, please let me know. Okay. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Um, yes. Unmuted. Make sure. Sound on. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining tonight. I see a couple of familiar names and faces. You can feel free to share your video if you'd like, and if you'd rather not, that's okay too. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt and insert them into the chat box, and Nicole can relay them to me during the talk. So I'm going to talk about healthy habits for the new year, keeping your joints active and healthy. By way of background, um, my training was through Princeton University as an undergraduate. I then did my medical school training at Jefferson in Philadelphia. I stayed there at the Rothman Institute for my residency in orthopedic surgery. And then I spent my fellowship in hip and knee replacement specifically at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. I've gone on to come back to this area uh, to start my, my practice. And I've now been part of the Rothman Institute in practice for over three years um, in this region, which is Egg Harbor Township. Um, and my focus is treatment of hip and knee arthritis. And that includes non-surgical treatment as well as surgical treatment that would include total knee replacement, partial knee replacement, total hip replacement, and then revision hip and knee replacement, which means repeat surgery on the hip and knee once it's already been replaced previously. As I mentioned, I'm working out of the Rothman Institute in the New Jersey offices, including Egg Harbor Township, Cape May Courthouse, Manahawkin. Um, surgeries in this region are performed out of the Atlanta Care facility. And um, that's a picture there of that medical center, which has a great uh, pavilion that's dedicated to Rothman patients um, and a really fantastic OR facility. And then some recent news from November of 2020, uh, we, the Rothman Institute, opened the Atlanta Care Center for Orthopedic Surgery, which is um, a, a joint center with Atlanta Care, and it's designed for outpatient surgery. And I was actually the first surgeon to perform a joint replacement there um, and have the patient go home the same day from that facility. It's a beautiful state-of-the-art place, so I'm really excited to bring people there um, and to share that type of experience with our patients. So to get on to the topic today, I'm gonna to talk a bit about arthritis to start. Arthritis is the most common cause of disability uh, in adults in the United States. And by 2040, it's projected that 78 million adults in our country are going to have arthritis of the hip or the knee, and that represents about 26% of the population. 
we know that this problem is more prevalent in females. And then if you look at the chart to the right, in the age group of 65 and older, it's almost 50% of the community. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has this set of recommendations in terms of treatments for arthritis. And I've highlighted the top two because those are the ones that have the most support when you look at research that's done and have evidence to back them up. And those include physical activity, which would be low impact aerobic exercise, as well as strengthening exercises and weight loss. Weight loss has a, has a really big effect on our hips and knees because our hips and knees carry a lot of our weight, in fact, five times and eight times your body weight experienced by those, those joints. And so weight loss can really take a lot of pressure off of the joints. There's also support for anti-inflammatory medications and tramadol. By the same token, there's been evidence that shows that there's not a lot of support for things like acupuncture. Glucosamine and chondroitin uh, also does not have very much support and nor does knee scopes to clean out arthritis. So those things are not so effective to treat arthritis. Um, more inconclusive recommendations are bracing and injections. And those are things that we use regularly because we're limited in what we can offer patients. And so quite frequently we'll be using steroid injections or gel injections, and they can have some temporary benefit to help patients prolong the life of their knee, treat their pain, um, but oftentimes, if there's arthritis at, in, at play, arthritis will get worse over time, and those patients may eventually be considering a joint replacement. So touching on those top two, which are part of the habits that I'm here to encourage, um, weight loss and physical activity, a big component of, of that is going to be your diet. And so I wanted to put a little note here that the Rothman Institute does have registered dietitians at a couple of the locations in Pennsylvania, as well as the New Jersey, New Jersey offices where, where I practice. And I think they're a real asset to patients um, to be able to have that kind of expert advice and then also accountability uh, towards reaching specific goals. On the side of physical activity, this is a paper that I, I pulled to share with you all. It's a 14-year longitudinal study uh, where there were two groups followed, those individuals who regularly exercise compared to a set of individuals who are more sedentary. Uh, and it showed very clearly that the active individuals had 25% less pain over that time period, as well as less arthritis and then it was a pronounced difference and so this offers some support for the idea that keeping up physical activity keeping your body in motion can lessen musculoskeletal pain and also the incidence of arthritis this is another study that i published in 2018 um, and i'm a runner myself actually i see it, some of my fellow runners logged on here um, and I, I looked at a large group of marathon runners, veteran marathon runners, and I was interested to see what their prevalence of arthritis was. Um, and basically, we were not able to find any relationship with running parameters and the occurrence of arthritis in these marathon runners. So it didn't matter if they ran uh, for, for many, many years, if they were running high mileage at a fast pace. Those factors really did not predict arthritis. The more common things that predict arthritis in the general population, of course, predicted arthritis in runners, and that would be age, family history, and surgical history. Um, so those were the things that apply to runners just as well as it does the general population. And then when I took that group of runners and I compared them to our general U.S. population, the active marathoners had a much lower rate of arthritis, 8.8% compared to 17.9%. So again, some evidence that, that gives support for staying active, keeping your body moving, and also a very common question that comes up amongst runners is whether or not they're gonna be more prone to wearing their joints out because of the activity that they do. And I, and I would say that in general, the answer to that question is no, and of course there are some nuances and special circumstances, um, but um, it's um, an important thing to think about. So overall, when we talk about physical activity, the um, guidelines from the U.S. Health Department are that all adults should stay active, avoid 
inactivity and that some physical activity is better than none. And the formal recommendation is at least 150 minutes per week of moderate activities like a brisk walk or 75 minutes of more vigorous activity like running. And then the other part of it is strengthening exercises, which are recommended at least two times per week. Um, and then the pyramid on the far right there gives you just some basic ideas and it doesn't have to be that you're actually going to do a workout per se, but simple everyday things like taking the stairs, walking someplace instead of driving, walking the dog, cleaning the house, those things count as physical activity. Um, and anything that you can do to increase activity and movement is a good thing. And it's gonna be beneficial to your joints. Cutting down on sitting time, computer time, TV time also has benefits. And then of course, there's more purposeful activities like cardiovascular activities, running, swimming, walking, biking, um, more recreational sports, or things like lifting weights, um, strengthening activities, yoga, stretching. All of those things um, count towards physical activity, and really it's going to be an individual uh, decision for you as to what works well for you given your particular circumstance. Um, but I do think that some aerobic activity, strengthening activi activity, flexibility, range of motion, core stability, um, including things like Pilates, yoga, those things are, are important. Um, and then the other thing I would stress to you is uh, when you think about your joints, it's important to do things in a safe manner. And so I made a note here um, that posture matters, your form matters, how you bend, squat, lift. Those are things that you should think about, particularly as, as you get older in life, um, that you're doing it in a safe manner where you're not putting undue pressure or stress on your knees. Dr. Ponzio, we actually have a, a couple questions here. Yeah, sure. um, Let's do first one. It says, do people with less arthritis exercise more because it hurts less for them or does exercising actually reduce the arthritis? So I think that, I think the two things that exercise doesn't necessarily reduce arthritis. There are other things that are out of our control like genetics and family history plays a role. I do think that exercise in, in individuals that are routinely active can lessen the symptoms that are experienced from arthritis. And I often see that in, in my patients that uh, those that kind of keep moving can actually take a scenario where I might look at an x-ray and say there's severe arthritis there um, and they may not have the symptoms to quite the degree that you may expect uh, because they've maintained motion despite the onset of arthritis. Um, but of course it's multifactorial, so it's not always um, so, clear. Uh, somebody else had put in here, uh, uh, conversely, the more you use a joint, the more wear you may have. So does that worsen arthritis? Yeah. So I think that's kind of what I was getting to with the marathon study is that it's not necessarily true that arthritis is from wear and tear. It's a bit of a myth. It's not that the more you do, the more you're going to wear it out. Um, the caveat to that is that if you've had some kind of injury, if you've had a meniscus tear from playing sports at, younger, at a younger age and, and then you went and did a lot of running, then yeah, you may, you may do some damage over time um, to your joint. Um, so there's, a, like I said, a lot of factors at play, but I think that the real etiology of arthritis is not truly uh, as simple as wear and tear. There's a bit more to the story. questions about supplements, but we'll get to that. Yeah, so supplements, I addressed chondroitin and glucosamine, um, and there are others. The They were on the not recommended list. It's not because they're harmful, and some patients do find some benefit, but when you look at the actual research studies that have been done comparing them to, say, a placebo, there's not good evidence that says that they work better than a placebo. And so I usually will tell patients that if it's something that you've tried and you have some subjective response to, and you find some benefit, then go ahead. It's not going to be harmful. How about something like fish oil? Fish oil, that would fall in the, in the same category. Yeah. So I would have the sort of the same response for that. So in terms of physical activity, the benefits are vast, you know, and we've touched on some of these, but cardiovascular health, muscle strength, endurance, balance, coordination, weight control, 
sense of well-being, stress reduction, antidepressant, improved bone density, it reduces the incidence of hip fractures later in life, improves blood pressure, cholesterol, reduces dementia, reduces mortality, and type 2 diabetes. So the benefits are clear and, um, and they're quite broad. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about joint replacement as some of you may be here to hear a little bit more about that and how that impacts activity levels and sometimes how it can benefit activity levels. So um, joint replacement of the hip and knee, those are effective, durable surgery, surgical procedures that we offer to enable pain relief and to restore lower extremity alignment and function and ultimately to improve quality of life. Um, I mentioned earlier on in the talk that the average age of arthritis onset and, and where people are considering a joint replacement is around 65 years of age. Um, but I treat patients that are much younger that, than that and also much older. So there's quite a wide scope uh, of people that joint replacement may uh, be an option for. And in fact, there's an increasing number of individuals that comes to me seeking joint replacement at a younger age as a means to maintain active lifestyles and to restore their ability to participate in some of their athletic activities of interest. So if we look at hip arthritis in particular, this is a diagram that would show what a normal hip might look like compared to a hip that has osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis basically means that you've worn through the cartilage or the padding on the ends of the bones such that you now have raw bone exposed and bone on bone contact between the two sides of the joint. And so the hip is a ball and socket joint that you can see here in the diagram. And this far right picture shows an actual femoral head or the ball part of the hip that's been removed in somebody that had arthritis. Um, and you can see how there's patches of irregularity. Um, that color is very abnormal. It really should be a real white, bright, um, smooth looking surface. And so that's an example of an arthritic hip. If you were to come to the office with hip arthritis, your most typical presenting symptom is going to be groin pain. So right in the crease of the top of your leg, pain can radiate down into the thigh. It can also present as knee pain on occasion, um, actually from hip arthritis, because it's all kind of connected. So the um, first thing that we do in the office, other than examining you and talking to you, um, is to get an x-ray. And so this is what a typical x-ray might look like in somebody who has arthritis. I've pointed out where the joint space is, so that's right between the ball and the socket. We can make out that there's a space in between those two structures. Um, that space is filled with cartilage or padding for the hip. And then on the other hip in the picture there, you can see the difference where there's no space left. And in, rather than a nice smooth ball, you have a really irregular deformed shape to that hip. Um, and those are all bone spurs, all of that is part of the process of arthritis, and this is an extreme example where the arthritis is quite severe. So after hip replacement, looking at an x-ray, this is what you would see. So you can see that that kind of deformity, that bone on bone is now removed, and in its place is this device, which creates a new ball in the socket, hip replacement. Um, and that is made out of ceramic and a plastic bearing that come together to give you a smooth joint, remove the pain generator of the bone on bone arthritis and restore range of motion through that hip. Um, so that's what that would look like on an x-ray. If I showed you what those parts look like um, sort of outside of the body, this is what, what you would see. So you see a stem um, that anchors into the thigh bone, a ball, like I mentioned, that's made out of a ceramic. There's a metal liner that forms the new cup on the pelvis side. And within that, there is a plastic or polyethylene uh, liner that snaps there and that forms your, your new cartilage, so to speak. So again, very low friction smooth interface that allows for pain-free range of motion. It really reproduces the hip joint quite well and creates what's a very successful surgery in, in the world of orthopedics. In terms of recovery after hip replacement, it's typically either going home the same day or spending one night in the hospital and going home around midday the next day. Patients after joint replacement are typically on a blood thinner for about six weeks, and that would be a baby aspirin. That's to prevent against blood clots after surgery. 
Um, you're allowed to put full weight on the leg right away after surgery. And in fact, we try to mobilize you fairly quickly after surgery. So if therapists will visit you while you're in the hospital or the surgical center um, and get you walking, practicing stairs. Uh, and the therapy after a hip replacement is really to walk. So I actually don't prescribe formal physical therapy after hip replacement. I tell patients during that first six weeks of recovery that I want them to be walking um, and not doing much else in terms of exercise. And then around six weeks, I do allow them to return to lower impact activities. It's three months before they can get back to high impact activities. So for my runners out there, um, three months before I'm letting you really start to run. And even then, you know, you're listening to your body, using common sense, touching base with me and making sure that that transition goes well. Driving um, is typically an average of around two to three weeks. And then the majority of patients are able to return to more sedentary type, type jobs by six weeks, sometimes sooner. Um, and more demanding occupations that are more physical may take longer, of course. So knee arthritis, similar in principle, but this is a diagram showing that. Smooth articular cartilage or the padding that coats the end of each of the bones is what forms the joint and the cushion for the joint. And when arthritis causes degradation of that cushion, that's when you have arthritis. Um, so this is a diagram of that. And then on the far right side of the screen, you can see a picture of what arthritis may look like. And this is actually the undersurface of the kneecap that's flipped up so that we can see it. Um, on the top photo, it looks like kind of a cauliflower kind of thing and all that is bone spurs that have grown around the kneecap due to severe arthritis. Um, and then beneath that, you can see the end of the thigh bone, the femur, um, which has grooves almost carved into it from, from severe arthritis in the knee. And then the bottom photo shows a knee that has been replaced um, and, it, and that kneecap again flipped over where the blue arrow is um, so that you can see the brand new surface on the kneecap very smooth. We've removed all the, the bone spurs. And of course, then there's new, new lining on the end of the thigh bone and the top of the shin bone to create again a, a cushion for the knee. So um, similar to the hip, when you come in, there's an exam, there's discussion as to what your symptoms are and, and, and what you're experiencing, and x-rays. So x-rays showing a normal knee are on the far left side of the screen here. So that looks like a space basically going across the center of the knee, and that space is where your knee bends and straightens. That space is filled with meniscus and the cartilage, the padding for the knee. When you have arthritis, that space is diminished and sometimes it may be just narrowed a little bit and other times it may be bone on bone like the picture in the center of the screen here. So there's no joint space there and that's going to be a very painful scenario. Restrictive of range of motion, pain with any type of activity, um, and limited um, in terms of what kinds of activities you're able to do. Um, on the far right, you can see a patient that has both knees affected and also resulting deformity. So this is called a valgus deformity or a knock knee deformity as the knees are going in towards each other. And the reason why that happened is arthritis. So, so that's something that we see. And the good news is that knee replacement is going to not only create space again and allow for a friction-free surface, but it's also going to allow us to correct the deformity in somebody that has uh, that kind of deformity associated with their arthritis. This is a picture of an x-ray after knee replacement. So in comparison to what you just saw, you can see that now there's a symmetric space across the joint um, and the leg is straight. And so the device that's in place is the picture on the far right. And those pieces basically provide a new surface on the end of each bone. And then the plastic liner is the, the uh, part of the component that's at the very far right of the screen. And that's what's creating the cushion or what looks like a space on this x-ray. Um, but these are very effective at uh, resolving the arthritis and, and giving you the ability to restore your activity and your range of motion. Again, this is a diagram showing you what a knee replacement looks like diagrammatically, um, that we're putting brand new surfaces on the ends of the bones. And a lot of people think a knee replacement means we're just cutting out the whole part of the leg there. And, and in fact, we're making rather small cuts in the bone to put brand new surfaces on. 
And so I think it's important as a patient, if you're going into a, one of these procedures, to really understand what it is that you're having done. Um, this picture of me operating shows an example of a case where we use robotics to do a knee replacement. Um, so that is something that is uh, more of an advancement in recent years. However, I will say that I don't use that routinely for everybody, and, and it's really something that is um, used for particular cases when needed. But it's kind of a neat, a neat thing. Partial knee replacement is a bit different than a total knee replacement. So this shows you an x-ray of what that might look like. This individual had um, an x-ray that showed arthritis, but it's really bone on bone, in just one part of the knee, and that's the inner part of the knee where you can see that the bone is touching. Um, and so we recreated a space in that portion of the knee with this device, which puts brand new surfaces on only half of the knee. Um, and so there's some benefits associated with this if you're an appropriate candidate where you have arthritis really strictly in one area of the knee, we can treat you with a partial knee replacement. It's less surgery, a bit of a quicker recovery. Ultimately, a partial knee replacement feels more like a normal knee in comparison to a total knee replacement. However, you have to be a good candidate for it. And so that would be something that you would talk to uh, your surgeon about um, as to whether or not your pattern of arthritis is appropriate for this type of surgery. In general, for knee replacement, the recovery is either same day surgery or one night in the hospital. You can again, put full weight on your leg immediately, a blood thinner again for six weeks. As opposed to hip replacement, I think it's a little bit more of a challenging surgery to go through. Um, and, and that is because there's a bit more pain, swelling, bruising, those types of things that you have to navigate through early on. And so I tell patients to kind of walk that fine line between keeping the knee moving after surgery so it doesn't get stiff, but not doing too much or so much that you're gonna get really swollen. And that's particularly important in week one and week two. And then after that, you tend to turn the corner and, and keep things moving in the right direction. Um, I tell patients that range of motion should be from zero to 90 degrees by about four weeks after surgery. And then by six weeks, you really should be almost back to what your expected outcome would be, which is around zero to 120, 130 degrees, depending on how flexible you are. Driving, again, around an average of three weeks, and patients can return to sedentary jobs um, right around six weeks and sometimes sooner, and then, of course, more demanding occupations may take a little bit longer. These are some basic exercises that you may be doing early on um, after a knee replacement in the first couple weeks. And then as you move closer to that six-week time frame and into three months, I would expect at that point that there are no pain medications involved Patients may need an occasional anti-inflammatory. There still will be some swelling right around the knee, but the rest of the leg should start to look more normal. Um, and this is a picture of somebody that had a knee replacement and she's about six weeks from surgery. So you can see what her incision would look like. The incision in both hip replacement and knee replacement is closed up with dissolvable stitches. There's glue on the surface that then falls off just like a scab would and leaves you with a fine line like this that would then be expected to fade over time and, and really look quite good, um, especially by the time you're a year out from surgery, two years out from surgery. And obviously our goal is to get people back to the things that they wanna be doing. And so these are some patients that have gone through joint replacements and are, are back to things they enjoy. And so when we, when we talk about that activity after surgery, I think the great thing about joint replacement and about being a surgeon is that we're able to give patients the opportunity to maintain or restore a fulfilling athletic experience. Um, and, you know, I'm an athlete, so I always have some ability to see eye to eye with my patients and, and understand what they want to be doing. Um, and, and sometimes it's a simple goal, like just getting off of a walker to a cane or being able to, to go to the grocery store and, and do the things that they need from day to day. And other times it's a very aggressive goal. Like they want to, you know, PR and on a, on a race or they want to get back to running or hiking or something of that nature. Um, surveys of patients show that there is return to sports in 60 to 90 percent of cases after joint replacement. Um, and I would say between hip replacement and knee replacement, 
there is more liberty towards getting back to more aggressive activities after a hip replacement. Knee replacement is um, probably a little bit less so and more nuanced towards the type of patient that you're dealing with. Um, and of course, I, I have to say that for every individual, it may vary and it depends on your general health, the type of implant that you have, um, and then also where you're coming from. So what your athletic experience was, your intensity level, and really what your desires are in terms of activities moving forward. Um, surgeons across the country and, and world will absolutely encourage low impact activity after joint replacement. So that would include things like walking, stair climbing, cycling, swimming, golfing, hiking, bowling, dancing, um, and then even things like rowing, skiing, tennis, ice skating. Um, the ones that are more questionable are the high joint loading activities, so things like running, high impact, um, martial arts, water skiing, ski, uh, skiing on moguls, rock climbing or sports that have a higher contact potential like football, uh, ice hockey, basketball, soccer. And those are things that are really gonna be more nuanced towards each individual patient and having a discussion with your surgeon um, to see whether that those types of things are appropriate or not. Um, and, and the caveat that I think most surgeons are going to say that we don't really know whether or not those more aggressive activities may lead to um, increased wear of your joint replacement and, and potentially wearing it out at an earlier time frame. So in conclusion, when we're talking about keeping your joints active and healthy, the things that I'm really promoting to you are aerobic exercise and in particular low impact aerobic exercise. Consistent activity, I can't stress enough, just keep your joints moving. The official recommendation is 30 minutes per day, five times per week and then strengthening exercises two times per week. Small changes that are achievable to improve nutrition can be hugely helpful and can really make a large impact. Um, I encourage you to talk to our dietitians here if that's of interest to you, um, or if you need help to maintain a healthy body weight. I think that they're a great resource. And um, like I said earlier in the talk, maintaining a healthy body weight can really help your joints substantially. Um, so it's probably one of the top things that you can do um, to alleviate some of the pressure on the knees and hips. Um, and then safe practices. So giving some thought to how you bend, squat, lift heavy objects, um, avoiding falls, particularly as, as we get older. Um, I treat a lot of uh, hip fracture patients at the hospital when I'm on call, and uh, a lot of those patients end up getting hip replacements for that reason. Um, and so falling is, is a common mechanism of injury and something that can be sometimes avoidable. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with being active and, and keeping um, uh, your balance as best as you can, and um, also moving things that are obstacles around the house. Um, so it's giving some thought to things you can do to avoid falls. And then consulting with a doctor if you have joint pain to see you know, what might be the root cause of that and then offering you some options that might treat the pain. Um, just because you have pain doesn't mean that you need joint replacement. There is certainly a spectrum of arthritis and pain and ways that we go about treating those things. And then if you are a patient that has had a joint replacement or that you're looking to have a joint replacement, really consulting with your surgeon on that in terms of what it is that you want to be doing afterwards um, so that we can help you get back your joint function and relieve your pain. So that is all I have. I'm going to give you this resource, which is the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. Um, so if anybody wants to jot down that website, um, it is. Um, you know, it's our national uh, body association for hip and knee replacement surgeons. And so there are really good resources there on that web page for patients. There's videos of surgical procedures. I think it's um, rather unbiased and, and pretty good information that's truthful, kind of gives you the full picture um, rather than what some of the marketing might be out there. Um, so I would uh, encourage you to check that website out. And then I'm happy to answer questions. I have my email address listed here. So if you have a particular or specific question about your case, um, you can feel free to email me. 
And of course, I can see you in the office um, in any of the New Jersey locations if you'd like to make an appointment. And I also have my Instagram account here where I post some interesting cases. So if anyone's interested in, in checking out some of those, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Awesome. Couple questions before we turn it over to Joanna. Okay. Uh, lots of questions about stem cells, PRP, cartilage restoration. What are your thoughts? Yeah. So, in general, um, again, there's not a lot of evidence to support those those types of treatments. Um, as of yet, there are no um, surgical procedures that can recreate cartilage or um, repair cartilage or get cartilage to grow. Uh, or inject cartilage for that matter. So it's sort of, you are, we're born with one set of cartilage and, and once there starts to be damage to that surface, um, you know, that, that's it. So these um, stem cell things are not actually generating new cartilage. Um, a lot of them are out-of-pocket expenses. Some of them aren't covered by insurance. Um, so, you know, personally, I don't, I do not offer PRP or stem cell injections um, because there's no good scientific evidence to support them at this point in time. There's definitely ongoing research and hopefully someday we'll have something that's, that's really helpful. In terms of cartilage repair, that, that's a slightly different topic because in the world of sports medicine um, and in a young patient population, there are some procedures that are done to do repair of small cartilage lesions. So um, that would be in situations where you might have um, you know, a centimeter's worth of area in your knee that has no cartilage and they can do some procedures to try to encourage some healing to take place. But again, even then, it's not cartilage that's gonna come back. Um, it's basically a scar tissue um, filling that space. And another one, regarding joint replacement surgery in the midst of a pandemic, what are we doing as far as safety protocols? Yeah. A great um, question. Great question and a very common concern. Um, and so, you know, of course, in the office here, there's lots of precautions. Everyone is um, coming to the door, getting temperatures checked and being asked a series of questions before they're allowed to enter. Um, we're only allowing patients to come into the office. Unfortunately, in general, there's no, there's no family members. So I'm doing a lot of conversations on uh, FaceTime um, if family members do want to listen in to the conversation conversations. Um, and then when it comes for, towards surgery, um, there's COVID testing, of course, before coming to the hospital. Um, so that's scheduled for um, two days prior. Um, and then in the hospital, things are, are definitely much more um, spaced out and isolated than before. And so your interactions are going to be a bit more limited. Of course, you're going to interact with your anesthesiologist and your surgeon and your therapist. Um, and, and then that's basically it. So um, you know, those, those practices are, are in place. And thus far, I've not have, have, I have not had a patient that's come for surgery and developed COVID. Um, and we've been keeping track of those numbers quite closely um, to make sure that we're, we're doing things in a safe way. Um, the surgical center is also, I think, a, a really great facility because you're not even staying overnight and you're not in a hospital. So um, I think it's even more isolated from, from the problem. Great. Um, so that's going to wrap up the first half of our presentation, and now we're going to pass it over to Joanna DeSantis, and she is going to review um, some simple exercises that are good for joint mobility and some of the questions that were submitted as well. Joanna, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can see you. Okay, excellent. I'm hoping that you'll be able to see the whole picture when I'm actually demonstrating the exercises. So bear with me. Um, but thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Dr. Ponzio, for having me. Uh, my name is Joanna DeSantis. I'm a physical therapist at Novacare Rehabilitation in our Bayville, New Jersey office. Um, I've been a physical therapist for 27 years, um, and I've been with Novacare for six. Um, so. I have a lot of questions um, that were sent, and I noticed that a lot of people are in the chat and asked um, some of the same questions that I'm going to address um, that were sent in earlier. Um, a lot of the questions were centered around mostly strengthening type exercises, the low impact options that Dr. Ponzio had spoke about, um, and also um, kind of the wide range, either just general strengthening exercises or um, 
you know, exercises that are done uh, post knee replacement, post hip replacement. Um, so we'll kind of review all of those things. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat box. So if anybody is asking any questions, um, I will try to keep keep on those. But Nicole, you can keep me online there. <laughs> um, so you know, one of the things that physical therapy is beneficial for it is it's kind of a more broad look at kind of everything that's going on. So even though you may have had your hip or your knee replaced, we're looking at other things like flexibility. We're looking at muscle flexibility, particularly. We're looking at balance. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, you know, falls, especially in the elderly, is a pretty big deal. So sometimes we can prevent those things from happening through these general exercises that I'm gonna show you today. Um, and also some of the low, you know, more low impact um, things. So sometimes it's better to see the therapist in the clinic, especially with balance exercises. Um, it is sometimes more of a safety concern. Um, so not everybody is doing you know, balanced exercises at home, depending on what level you're at. If there's safety that's a concern, obviously we would probably wanna work more in the clinic. So um, the first things, um, kind of reviewing just in general, um, as Dr. Ponzio stated that, you know, for the hip more so, she kind of lets everybody kind of uh, do their thing for the first six weeks. Um, and with knee patients, it's a little bit different. Um, in those first few weeks post-operatively, which was a few of the questions, you know, what are the best kind of progressions through that time from post-operative, you know, even to three to four to five months out. Um, and, you know, within those first few weeks, you know, there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of swelling. So we kind of limit the exercises to doing more what we call isometric strengthening. So we still are having people warm up by doing some kind of low impact activity, whether it be biking, whether it be walking. Um, and then we get into other things like stretching. And the stretching can be done either in weight bearing or in non weight bearing. So for instance, we're gonna work on stretching some of those bigger muscles of the legs like your hamstring or your calf. We can do that either in a weight bearing position. And if that's too uncomfortable, we can do that in a non weight bearing position. So I'm gonna to try to show you um, a stretch for the calf in both a weight bearing and a non weight bearing. Can everybody see me? So we can use things like straps at home. If you don't have fancy straps like this, we can do things like towels, belts, anything like that. So to stretch the calf in a non-impact way, I'm gonna sit on the table, put the band around, pull back until I feel a comfortable stretch on the calf. Usually we're holding these stretches for about 30 seconds and doing about five repetitions. So after the 30 seconds, you kind of let it off, wait a few seconds, put the stretch back on that's a good stretch for the calf that's low impact. For a, a weight bearing exercise or a bigger, you know, might feel a bigger stretch on the calf, we can come against the wall, put one foot in front of the other, and lean forward. Again, same count, you're holding it for 30 seconds and doing five on each side. For the bigger muscle, the hamstring, you can use a step or a stool in standing I have a stool on the floor, I'm not sure you can see, but you can put your foot here and then just lean forward. And again, you want a comfortable pull. We're not trying to touch our toe, we're just trying to feel a comfortable stretch here on the muscle itself. You're not bouncing or doing anything like that where you could sustain some muscle tearing. So you just wanna hold that stretch. You always wanna not rush through stretching, hold it for those 30 seconds so that the muscle has time to elongate and then back off the stretch. That's the standing version. If that's too much, a lower impact, you can put your foot on, on your bed at home, lean forward. Same, 
Same principle here. You're holding that stretch. You're not bouncing. You don't need to touch your toe. It's about feeling a comfortable pull. So those are some stretching options for your muscles, both in a weight-bearing position or a non-weight-bearing position. And a few of the questions um, that people had asked is, you know, if I exercise, do I use pain as my guide? Absolutely 100%. If you're doing something, whether it be a stretch, whether it be yoga, whether it be running, if there's pain involved, you need to kind of back it off. So definitely let pain be your guide. Maybe modify the exercise. Maybe if you're running, walk. Um, so just kind of lowering that, you know, the, the activity that's kind of causing the pain or just backing off a little bit. Um, again, in reference to um, surgery, we're still kind of using this whole concept of, you know, in therapy, if something is weight bearing and you're doing this exercise like squatting or something, we will modify that. So you don't really want to have pain while you're performing an exercise. You may have discomfort, um, but you don't want something that, you know, you're, you're coming back the next day and you're in, in a lot of pain or you have swelling. So always letting pain be your guide. Now, some of the exercises that are good for strengthening your hip and your knee, um, again, we can vary them and do them standing, do them laying. Um, the difference between that is gravity. Um, so if we're standing and doing an exercise, like a lot of times if we actually do see hip patients that are postoperatively, we start with standing exercises just to get the range of motion of the joint and start strengthening the joint. Now, obviously, as we progress through these exercises, you can add weight, you, um, you can increase repetitions, you can add weight, you can do a lot of different things. We use bands in, the ther in therapy. I have all different options back there on my table. So some examples of some exercises that we may do after a hip replacement or even to strengthen the hip. And again, it may be that this is where we're starting this exercise, that we're not going into a full gravity position because maybe you're not ready for that yet. So some of the exercises that we would do to strengthen the hip would be, you can stand by a chair, Stand by a countertop, that's the best place. Bring your leg out to the side, remove that stool, <laughs> okay? Usually three sets of 10. If you do both legs, sometimes it's easier to do 10 repetitions, then switch and do the other side. So that's hip abduction, moving your legs away from your body. There's hip extension, which is pushing back. And again, 10 repetitions, usually three sets of 10, resting in between. There's things like marching, where you can alternate. And the thing that's nice about these is you're strengthening the muscle, you're getting some range of motion, and then you're also getting some standing balance on one leg while you're doing these. So the opposite, which we were talking about. We have weights, so you can put a cuff weight on if you want, or you can just change into a gravity position. So now you're doing, instead of marching, leg lifts. You can do leg lifts on the side. You can do leg lifts on your stomach. Okay. And all, all the same cap. Usually three sets of 10 allowing yourself some rest period in between. So those are some, some of the exercises that you can do that are called open chain, where your leg is off the ground. There's also some closed chain exercises that are also good. Um, one of them is squatting. All right. And a squat doesn't need to be like a you know, what a muscle person would do, a body weight, you know, huge weight lifter. 
mini squat. So if you can see, I'll turn to the side. Just let me push this down a little bit. Little squats. You want to make sure your knee's not coming over your toes. You're kind of sticking your buttock back as if you're going to sit on a chair. Again, holding on for some balance if that's a concern. This is a good exercise. It's a total lower body exercise um, that helps strengthen the joints. The other, if you have a step or you can use your stairs at home, is just a step up. So that's my step stool. Again, if you have something to hold on to, if you need to, stepping up on the step, stepping back off the step. You can do this front. And again, 10 repetitions, then switch. Lead with the opposite leg. You can also strengthen your hips and your lateral leg by doing a side step up and down. And again, you're switching sides and now you're doing the opposite side. Usually these exercises are three sets of 10. And again, the recommendation is two to three times a week for the strengthening exercises. Now some of the other exercises for balance, um, again, if there is an issue with balance where safety is a concern, I would not recommend you do these at home. Maybe do come and do a formal physical therapy program where there's, you know, the therapist there to guard you. Um, and those can be things as simple as, again, I love my countertops in houses. Um, when I treat people in their home, using the countertop, using a sturdy chair, just trying to balance on one leg. So lifting that leg up, trying to balance. I don't know if you can see that. It's hard to see. Um, but you're standing, kind of balancing on one leg. Be near something where you can hold on, a countertop, just for your point of reference. And, you know, the other thing we, a lot of people talked about, um, you know, if they're not active, another question was, how do I, you know, start to be active? And again, you know, everything, you have to start gradually. If you're somebody that's, you know, had an injury or you haven't been, you know, working out or you haven't been running, obviously you want to start slowly. If you're a runner, maybe, and you've had an injury, maybe like a walk to a run and gradually increase from there. Um, if you're somebody who hasn't, doesn't exercise, not a marathon runner, gradual increasing your low impact activity. Walking five to 10 minutes to start, and then gradually increasing that. Riding a stationary bike, starting at five to 10 minutes, and then gradually increase the time. So, you know, those are some of the things with exercising, you know, you wanna be safe. Um, low impact activity is excellent for the joints. Um, and, you know, the other thing we focus on too, and this is good for everybody um, from, you know, the not real active, even to the marathon runners, is working your core. So, you know, some really good core exercises. When we talk about the core, you know, we're talking about strengthening your middle, your core. I always say your butt, your gut, and your abs. So you're getting all of that activity that you're doing, if your core isn't strong, I guess, you, you know, you're kind of at a disadvantage. So things that can strengthen your core are things like plank. I don't know if I actually want to demonstrate a plank right now. Um, and it's hard with my situation here in the room, um, but things like plank, some easier things. I'll show you on the table. Bridging. So keeping your belly tight, lifting your butt up off the table and slowly lowering it down. So these are activities that can help strengthen your core. 
So it's really important to have kind of a well-rounded exercise routine. You know, working with a therapist is one way you can develop a program with the therapist. Um, you want to, the main thing is you want to be safe. Um, and you want to minimize pain and impact on the joints. Um, let me see. Oh, Deborah asked, I, I could definitely, I can get with Nicole and um, we can put together these exercises and I can send them to you. Rana, we also had a couple questions about shoulders. People were asking about shoulder mobility. Okay. Um, do you have any exercises you recommend? Um, so for shoulder mobility, again, depending on what's happening, um, you know, one of the things you can do in your own home, let me see if I can get a good wall spot here, um, is like a wall walk or a wall climb. So you can just start, let me see if I can get this. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so you can start with your hand on the wall and kind of walk up the wall, or you can even just, you know, kind of crawl, kind of crawl. And again, you're going to that point where you don't want to like overdo it, where you're in pain or you're feeling you can't go or it's beyond that point. Once you get to that point where you feel it's a comfortable pull, hold it for about five seconds, you can do 10 of those and kind of slowly either slide or walk your way down the wall. So the first part, that's flexion. I'm gonna turn a little bit just so you can get the idea. That's forward. And then you can also do it at the side, lifting. This may be a little bit more difficult depending on what's happening with your shoulder, whether you have impingement there of your rotator cuff or a little inflammation of the rotator cuff. So the one on the side might be a little bit more difficult um, so sticking with just the straight on, this could be a really good mobility exercise for the shoulder. There's also other stretching, like you can stretch your shoulder across. That stretches the posterior capsule of your shoulder and around the back of your shoulder. And then a lot of times, you know, even just stretching your neck. So part of, you know, if you have tightness in through your neck, that's going to affect the shoulder. I mean, the shoulder is a whole other, you know, issue. We talked about posture and how important that is in the lecture. Um, but, you know, shoulder pain, you can't address shoulder pain in physical therapy unless you are addressing posture. Because a lot of times that does have to do with, you know, your mobility of your shoulder blade, which is on the back, which moves when we elevate our shoulders. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we would address in physical therapy, you know, posturally, range of motion, and then of course, strengthening. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> um, one last question for patients who are in New Jersey, talk to me about how they can get to you or to a physical therapist? So um, what you can do is, if to get to me specifically, um, you can go to novacare.com. Depending on where you're looking to go to, we have um, locations from Lakehurst and Bayville up here in the north, all the way down to Cape May. So if you go on novacare.com, you can actually find a location that's closest to you. Um, I don't have like a PowerPoint or anything with my specific email on it, but if anybody has a pen and you have any questions, you can reach out to me. Um, my email is jdesantis, as my name is showing on the video, at selectmedical.com. And please feel free to reach out. Um, any questions you have that I can answer, I'd be happy to. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this entire presentation has been recorded. So we have all of Joanna's exercises recorded here. And I will be sending out that link uh, hopefully by the end of the week. So you can certainly reference this. 
I will also be sending out the link that Dr. Ponzio mentioned in her presentation that has additional exercises as well. Uh, so keep an eye out for that email. It'll come directly from me. If anybody has any questions, you can feel free to shoot me an email um, and I'm happy to help in any way that I can. But again, thank you, Dr. Ponzio. Thank you, Joanna and Jamie from Novacare. We truly appreciate you guys helping us out with this. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us as well. Good night.